Hi, everyone. This is Ray Luskin, award-winning artist, author, activist, and the Creative Mindfulness Mentor. And you are going to be up for such a treat today for our Women Who Dare conference. Um, I have brought together an intersection of women, leaders in our community, our artists, and uh, people who are health providers and social change agents. And this has been such an extremely difficult year and a half. We need their tools. We need their strategies to self-care, to creating social change, and just in implementing new ideas. And so I wanted to bring some wonderful people. And today I have Anne Hamburger. She is an award-winning artistic director, founder of Ingard Arts, and is a pioneer in site-specific theater. Um, she's had a varied history, and I can't wait to dive in and let you know more about her. So welcome, Anne. Thank you. Why don't we start with what is site-specific theater? Just to, to let, you know, since that is a big part of what you do. Yes, yeah, so site-specific work is work where um, I have commissioned uh, playwrights, directors, composers, and designers to create pieces for spaces. And that could be an architectural site or a city street or occupying a neighborhood. So it's basically using the city as our stage. That's very cool. Okay, so On Guard goes all the way back to 1985. So I know it's been through some idea, you know, different iterations. So why don't you tell us about what your vision was then and what your vision is now? Uh, sure. I, you know, I think it's been, there's been a very consistent through line. I've always been very conscious and aware of the fact that um, a lot of times artists and, uh, and theater artists are creating pieces, but they stay in the same lib liberal echo chamber, the same liberal bubble. And so by doing site specific work, we were able and are able to get out into the neighborhoods, to get out into communities, to have people who normally would never see a piece of work, see it by virtue of its location. And um, we're doing that today. I mean, I basically say there's one sentence that sums up um, kind of in a way my life's work, which is, um, that on guard arts, uh, we don't just look at what stories we tell, but we look at where we tell them, how we tell them, and to whom. I love that. I, I really, I really got into when I was reading about your mission that there is like a threefold. And do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, sure. Well, I'm not sure exactly what. Uh, All right, it was sparking dialogue. Increasing empathy and oh. talking about the unspoken truth. And oh, I think it's okay. really relevant for today. Yeah, well, I think, I, you know, when, when we create content, we, look, we want to make sure that it's very accessible. Um, that doesn't mean that it's um, uh, superficial, um, but uh, I think it's very important when delving into a, a salient issue of our time that it, that one brings it to life in a way that that is very humanizing um, and that um, it's not it doesn't uh, delve into kind of political didacticism and I think um, our world has and our media and social media has just made uh, the standoff between people with different ideas um, worse than it's ever been before. And I think theater has the unique ability to bring people together, to bring people together from different neighborhoods, different, um, uh, different economic uh, brackets, different um, races and ethnicities and bring them all together in one room so that they can come together in conversation in ways that they wouldn't otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so what inspired you to do this? I mean, this is very interesting concept that I really wasn't familiar with till I ran across your, your work on Venmo this year. So yeah. It's a little bit of a tree falls in the forest, you know? Okay. I mean, I've always been very concerned about impact um, and it's at the center of everything I do. I mean, when I started, I started off in visual arts and was very interested in public art um, and in earthworks and in things that really did bring the general public into contact with art they might otherwise not have seen. And so I feel like 
I'm not personally interested in using my work to preach to the converted. I'm using, I want my work to get out there. Um, in 2014, we did a show called Base Track Live, which was about the impact of war on veterans and their families. And while we did do that in theaters and we did it at the Brooklyn Academy of Music on the Harvey stage, we did take it all over the country. And we even went to Fort Hood military base. Wow. So we could, um, perform this piece for uh, active duty uh, army, army um, for the active uh, people in, who were in active duty who were in the army. And it had an enormous impact. I mean, the army did a study afterwards and found that our show helped reduce um, stigma towards getting mental health services by 33%. That's huge. That is huge. I, it's, it's really interesting. The last time I actually did this <coughs> Creative Activist Summit, I had somebody named Roman Baca, who was a soldier. I know Roman. Okay. And yeah. I interviewed him and I found it fascinating how, yeah. you know, he brought it, you know, he brought in the soldiers and the work that he did was all about that same thing to reduce stigma. So, okay. Small world, small world. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if he ever got to go back. He only went back once when I had talked to him six years ago when he was hoping to go back and do some well, more He's work living in things. London now. So I do Oh, know. well, then he's over there. Okay, uh -huh. very cool. And so, then the most, the most recent show that we did um, was a piece called um, A Dozen Dreams. And- um, That's the one I saw. Um, um, I found it on Vimeo. I mean, I don't know how I found you, but it was like, this was something and it intrigued me. You know, and I could be sitting in Chicago and getting the, you know, experience of what you were trying to tell the story. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I felt like, I mean, I feel like as someone who runs a creative organization, it's very important to be hyper alert to what's going on in the world around me um, and to be able to shift gears and change um, with the changes in the world. And clearly um, COVID uh, had a huge impact on right. um, our life, our world, our economics and the theater. And so I said, what kind of project could I do during COVID um, that uh, I could put up uh, that would be safe? And I was also very interested in what kind of impact COVID has had upon our mental health. And so I reached out to a dozen women playwrights and I said, what are you dreaming about right now? And their assignment was to come back with three minute dreams, either waking dreams or sleeping dreams um, and record them for me. And then I commissioned an incredible visual designer named Irina Crusolina. Um, and we created 12 different rooms, each room representing um, one dream um, through sets, lights, video and sound. We put it in an empty store at, Arts, at Brookfield Place um, in uh, Manhattan, downtown. And, the audience went through two at a time. So you were never in a room with more than two people and with and those were with one other person. And those were the people that you came with. And it was enormously successful. We're actually looking now for property in both New York City and other cities where we can uh, remount it because it was so successful and because of the limited capacity, uh, we could, a lot of people couldn't get in. I mean, we had a three quarter page rave in the New York Times that was very uh, gratifying. Um, well, th yeah. there's a space in Chicago and downtown Chicago that might work for it. Right now they've got the, um, the Van Gogh there and it's, it's a beautiful space and you probably, there's a lot of rooms already and then you can subdivide some more. So just a thought. So. <laughs> Great. It'd be wonderful. I mean, I, that was my first venture out into that kind of experience was so empowering after COVID to just, I took my, my two granddaughters who were six and two and my daughter, and it was an, a fabulous experience just to be able to walk through something and watch their eyes with the wonder of life, you know, with the way the, the light hit them and the images. And so I, I totally could see that in that space. It would be a phenomenal show. So Thank thought. you. <laughs> um, so I, I find, you know, you said you were in, into visual arts, but you also did some other work for Disney at one point. So what was Right. That well, um, I started on Guard Arts in 1985 and um, really am responsible for putting this site specific work on the map in New York City um, and ran on Guard Arts for 13 years. But I had kids. I had twins. 
And so all of a sudden I had three babies. I had Ungard Arts and two babies. <laughs> and I also saw the city changing. I saw the sites drying up. Of course, now we're completely back into a place that we were in the 80s where there's right. lots of empty buildings. Lots of empty buildings, yeah. yes. But there, I saw all that changing. And um, I was really kind of uh, ready for a different challenge. And I got approached by a... Um, a search firm saying, we're familiar with your work and we'd really like to um, have you come in an interview to found and run a global division for Disney. And I was completely taken aback <laughs> and shocked by the whole thing, but um, I decided to go in for the interview and I actually got the job. So I became an executive vice president in charge of a new division, which was a global entertainment division doing all of the major stage shows and parades and daytime and nighttime spectacles for all the parks around the world. And um, I, we moved the family there and my husband stayed at home with the kids. And um, I spent almost nine years at Disney. And then after that, we came back to New York and I decided that what I really wanted to do was work around social change um, and site-specific work. And we, I relaunched On Guard Arts and that's what I've been doing ever since. I love that. So I, I'm curious, um, what's your favorite book on creativity? Who what? Is, I, what is your favorite book or person on creativity? Who inspires you? I don't know if it's a book. I, I, I have some very, very close collaborative relationships. Uh, okay. I think they're different, different um, fellow artists that have inspired me um, along the way. There's a woman named Anne Bogart who run ran, who's written quite a few books actually um who ran the director's program and is running the director's program at columbia graduate school and she has been a major inspiration for me um kind of throughout my life really she's been one of the major inspirations for me and then really kind of great and dear and terrific mentors like joe malillo joe malillo was the um the head of the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And I was his intern in 1985. Wow. And he became a lifelong friend. And he's a great example of what it means to be a superb and extraordinary human being. Um, and a lot of the artists that I work with end up inspiring me in different ways at different times. So I feel like I'm constantly learning. And um, I actually am planning to get a tattoo on my wrist that says emerging. Oh, I love I, it. <laughs> I feel like we're never too old to change and learn and grow and uh, find out. One things. of my core values is, is growth. It's personal and spiritual growth. Those are big for me. So, and it covers a multitude of things. So, That's true. That's true. Um, you said a mentor. Why don't you talk about a mentor relationship? And, and cause I don't think people really understand that very well. Yeah, I think it's really important. And I, I think there are people who think, well, I'm too old to have a mentor. And I don't think um, we're ever too old to have mentors. I think I tell students who are getting out of college, find somebody whose work you adore and then make yourself indispensable to them. Because I think people, you know, I think people from different generations, people can learn a lot from people who were born in different generations. I can learn a lot from millennials. Millennials can learn a lot from me. You know, people who get out of college can learn a lot from me, but I can learn a lot from them. And so I think this relationship of having someone who you love and adore and loves and adores you, who you respect, who you admire. It's like, you know, we're born into families and then we create our own families. And I think we never get to a place in our life where we don't need a sounding board, where we don't need someone to confide in. Where, you know, being in the arts is very, very, very tough. You get knocked down a lot. And if you're not extremely resilient, you quit. <laughs> because it's, it, so what you, know, you have, your, you have your, your grand successes, but then you also have your failures. You have your oh. times when you can raise money and times when it's very difficult. I mean, you just there's just a lot of challenges that come come someone's way and you know I, I kind of have the personality where I, I always say you know you learn all the right ways to do things and then if that doesn't work you do whatever it takes short of breaking the law <laughs> so okay so you mentioned resilience especially lately we've needed what does that mean to you and, and what are some of the tools you use to, to hone in on your own resilience 
Well, I think I try to imagine a way forward. Okay. Um, I think that uh, when things get tough, rather than, you know, going and taking a nap or, you know, vegging on TV series, <laughs> which I can do, you know, I start to think about, okay, like COVID, you know, here's COVID. There were a bunch of theaters that said, well, we're just going to have to wait till it's over. And I said, I'm not, I'm too impatient for that. So here's all the things we can't do. We can't be in theaters, right? Um, we can't be around too many people. What can we do? You know, we can be outside. I did a musical performance on the steps of my brownstone and closed off the street and put access on the street so no more than 50 people can come when there was that 50 person limit right. to public gatherings. So it's always about what can you do? And if you're faced in one direction and you're banging your head against the wall, then you basically need to turn around. So yeah, how you do know, you pivot? And, you know, I, I love the question. Uh, what can I do with what I have right now? And that, that's always been one of my, uh, you know, questions that I always ask for myself, you know, just that same thing. So how can you pivot? I know for me, you know, my, my grandchildren were in California. I couldn't see my grandkids here for a while because I was sick. And so what could I do to connect with them? Well, I had dance parties on Zoom. You know, I taught art lessons. I figured out how to teach some art in California. And every week we had an art lesson. They were being homeschooled. You know, those kinds of things. And, it, and, and that's, that's resilience. And that's also asking, what can I do right now with what I have? And I think that, especially during the last year and a half, is really important. So Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I know, let's talk about how your vision has changed over the last few years and what you're really looking for now. I think when I first started On Guard Arts, all I wanted to do was site-specific work and the work was very New York City centric. Um, and then when I came back from Disney, I felt like I wanted to do work in theaters as well. Um, the next show that we have, Fandango for Butterflies and Coyotes. I was gonna ask you about that, so Yeah, go well that's, that started at La Mama and it started with me asking the question, what would it be like to do a piece based on the stories of undocumented immigrants? And this wonderfully gifted writer, who also was a writer in um, A Dozen Dreams, by the way, Andrea Tome, um, um, wrote the piece. And this amazing composer, Sinway Padilla, who um, is one of the leaders of the Fandango movement in New York, which is a celebration of music and dance that originally hailed from Veracruz, Mexico. Um, Somehow this, I always thought about Fandango as Spain, so that's interesting, okay. <laughs> uh, put this piece together and we worked on it for like uh, almost two years. And then when we decided that what we wanted to do was to take it on a five borough tour, because if we just performed it at La Mama in New York City, we wouldn't be reaching the kind of broad-based um, population that we wanted to. We also uh, did it um, with Spanish and English subtitles on screens on the stage so that people that didn't speak English um, could see it. People who didn't speak Spanish would understand what the music was saying. And it was hugely successful. It was a New York Times critics pick. And um, we loaded into Lehman College in the Bronx and we were gonna be performing the next night. And that was March 12th, I think. And the vice president came in and said, you can't perform tomorrow night. COVID is shutting us down. And so I kind of put that project on hold and then developed a dozen dreams. I also developed a festival with a business improvement district called Downtown Live that we did. That was 30 performances over two weekends during COVID of a dance cabaret performance. Um, in unusual spaces like a loading dock and a plaza. Um, but back to Fandango, I had to put that aside and now we're bringing it back and we're going to Penn State and we're going to University of Maryland. And by the time you air this, that will have already happened. And we're coming back into New York from October 12th through 17th. But then it's also going to go out to La Jolla, uh, summer of 22 and, um, and uh, uh, we have some other offers and interests from um, uh, other presenters who want to bring it to their cities. Because when something, when you work on something and it's really, really good, um, and you try to get it, so it's really, really good. It has a future life because mm -hmm. I'm not really interested in like 
reading a play, producing it for a four week run in New York and then closing it and then going on to the next play. I like that process isn't interesting to me. I'm interested in developing ideas with artists that can come up with something that's new and has never been seen before. Looking right. at unconventional ways of telling stories. Got it. Yeah, there's a, a theater group here called Her Story, Mary Bonnet, and she's done plays on sex trafficking. You know, there's been a whole series and she is uh, finding communities that can't afford a play, don't know how to write one, you know, to bring it out. So for that same reason, there's a, there's a message there. There's the learning curve and, and finding different ways and, and means to do that. And I've always thought that would be some kind of resource you know, guide we could put together some directory for all these people who are doing incredible work and having a message and trying to create social change. I don't know how that would work, but I, you know, I've joined different directories and I'm thinking maybe something like that down the road. Uh, because I think like you have a message, you have many messages and they deserve to be seen around the country and around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, with the show that we did Wilderness, I mean, Bass Track went to 40 cities. And then uh, the show that we did will, that was called Wilderness, which was about teenage mental health issues and parents who sent their kids to um, wilderness therapy programs um, was published and is being done. It was first produced in New York in 2016. It's still being done around the country. It's being done by high schools and colleges that want to use theater to um, bust open the conversation around mental health. Yeah, and a crucial conversation right now. So, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. I love what you've been doing. So I, I'd love to know about, um, you have some changes you wanted to create, some initiatives to move forward, like in your leadership strategy, from single to diverse leadership. What does that mean to you? Yeah, um, I think, you know, one of the things that I have become very aware of with the Black Lives Matter movement coming into high relief that, you know, I'm a 68 year old white woman. <laughs> and um, I think it's time to really make sure that um, I take responsibility for creating a pipeline for a younger generation and a new generation of artists and producers of color to find a home in a not-for-profit organization. And so we're just starting to put plans into place to create a collaborative leadership model. And um, we're starting by um, craft, creating a think tank and I've chosen a small number of people who I have great respect for, who also are a diverse group of people. And um, we're gonna have a series of conversations around what a collaborative leadership model might look like. We'll bring in some guest speakers and then um, we'll embark on designing a curatorial process where we can pick three to five people who are interested in having a long-term commitment to Encore Arts, who have shared values, who are self-generating artists. One might be a playwright, one might be a designer, one might be a director, one might be a producer. And we will, we will be determining if those folks will have three-year residencies or five-year residencies, and then we'll kind of shift. And then at that time, I will take a step back. Um, I'm very much looking forward to starting um, a retreat. My husband's family has property in Martha's Vineyard um, for uh, artists who devise work where a group of artists come together to create a piece. And, um, uh, and I'm excited by it. I'm excited by kind of investigating what, how can we take, how can we broach new forms? What does it mean? How do we make space for a younger generation of artists of color who previously haven't had space made for them? And how can I participate in that? I think it's right. very important. I'm interested in taking on that personal responsibility. And as a matter of fact, on Wednesday, <laughs> I've been asked to be on a panel, which is um, uh, called, called uh, the organization is CCCADI, and it's at 12 o'clock online, and um, it's uh, all white people on a panel who participated in their anti-racism uh, workshops, and so there were a few hundred people that participated in those workshops, and I've been asked to represent um, 
one of their students on the panel, which I'm very honored by. And I said, so what did well, you I, learn in this workshop? What, well, what did I, you find I, out about yourself? Well, it's, it's, I can't kind of summarize it easily because it's complicated, but I think one of the things that I personally felt was important is I think I've been scared to make public statements because I was worried I might mess it up. Right? I was worried I might say the wrong thing. And I think um, I recognize that I can't let my fear of saying the wrong thing uh, prevent me from making public statements. But I also think that there when this the George Floyd stuff happened, there were a lot of people that came out making public statements and it it didn't really go anywhere. It was pretty superficial in terms of um, the follow up. And I feel like this collaborative leadership model that we're embarking on is a way to, you know, really um, make sure that every facet of on guard arts is um, is engaged in looking at anti-racism and how to give people of color new opportunities and that that's very important. Yeah, I, I during COVID, I took a workshop. It was like an eight week workshop from Florida State Theater. Uh, and it was wonderful because it was, we got to, we, we would read two plays or see a play and then read or whatever excerpts. One was written by a, a white person and another was a person of color. And then they had all these other uh, people of color come in and talk to us and share their, their visions and things like that. And it was fascinating, you know, and to recognize your own bias, you know, mm -hmm. and, and things like that. And, and just the conversations were very rich. So I can see where this would go and, and how they were changing their model, who was going to be at the table, you know, and that's always a question, who's going to be at the table and to take us to that next level. So I think that's wonderful. Now, let's talk about funding, though. I mean, you're, you're a non for profit. How do you get funding and where do you see that going in the future? Um, I think we get funding like most non for profits do and that we, you know, we have a board and we um, do a gala every year. Like I said, we're doing our gala on October 12th and we apply to foundations and we get government funding. I, I personally think, um, so sorry to try to silence my phone. I, I personally think that the government um, uh, really needs to take a much larger role in supporting the arts. But what we've done this year, what we discovered during COVID also is that the business improvement districts in New York City are going to be looking to arts programming as an economic development initiative because people aren't going back to work full time. People aren't going back to work full time. There are a lot of empty storefronts. There's a huge vacancy rate. And so how can the arts play a part in getting people to appreciate and enjoy their city and frequent restaurants and go to stores. And the downtown uh, live festival that we did with the Downtown Alliance did just that. And they paid for the festival. So oh, we're, that's actually, wonderful. Yeah. we're actually developing new ways of thinking about generating earned income as well. But we always are you know, looking for um, philanthropic individuals who want to support our work. It's very, very important to what we do. And um, we want to be um, expanding our board as well, making sure that we have more people of color on the board. That's important to us also. Mm -hmm. So it's about really looking at every facet of the organization and being innovative in how you raise money and who you talk to and what your marketing is. Right, you know. right. Well, and the uh, UN has declared that the arts are a definite part of the infrastructure. You know, the, you economic, the UN has had something that came out, I think, last year about arts are part of the infrastructure, economic infrastructure. And it's more than just the performers. It is the vendors, like you were saying. It's the, the people who work behind the scenes. It's all of that. And how do you bring them together? Mm -hmm. And that becomes um, a challenge, you know, especially as we are rethinking what life looks like, what theater looks like. And now New York is opening up again with theater. And so it, it changes it once again. And, uh, you know, people are coming to visit again, those kind of things. So I get it. It's, it, I think you have to be vigilant, you know, and be, and it sounds like you are, that you've really considered what you want to do to go forward, some tools that you can employ. And uh, I love that. So what, besides, your retreat so what are your dreams you know you talk about your your dreams you know for your the 12 people what dreams do you have i 
it's an interesting question. I want to keep making work for as long as I can. I mean, and have the resources and the tools to do that. And I feel very grateful to be part of an artistic community. I feel very lucky to have, be able to devote myself to something I'd love to do. So for me, um, you know, I, I have a great life. You know, I, I love New York City. Um, and I have two well-adjusted kids. That and, always help. Yeah. And so I just think about keep continuing to create work that I love to do and finding the resources to do it. And then, as I said, yes, I would like to start a retreat that happened a couple of times a year where I can bring the groups of artists that are generating new work and be a host. I'm a real people person, so I love being around people and hosting artists and helping artists to create work. It, it means a lot to me. Oh, that's wonderful. It makes me happy. Hey, that's all you can ask from the work you do. Um, I would love to, why don't you share how people can find you or get a hold of you and learn more about your organization? Sure. Well, um, I have, uh, I have both uh, On Guard Arts and Ann Hamburger are both on Instagram and Facebook. And we have a website that is onguardarts.org, which is E-N-G-A-R-D-E-A-R-T-S.org. So those are the ways that, and for people who are interested in our work, they should like our pages. And that way they'll Fabulous. find out more. Thank you. I so appreciate you. And as Helen Keller said, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. And thank you for being part of our conversation today, and. And I look forward to seeing what else you bring to the table. You know? Thank you for having me. So, and everybody, if you want to find out more about my work, you can go to thewinningadventure.com or rayluskin.com. And thank you again for joining us and keep tuned and you'll find out more about what we're doing. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.